everyone. Uh, welcome to this session of Caregiver Talks. I just want to check to make sure we are recording. Yes, we are recording this. This is a recorded session so that we could post it on our uh, on the Wellspring website for for you to view and others to view at their convenience and at their uh, at their their timelines. Uh, as I can only appreciate with caregiving and being a caregiver that um, sometimes our time is surrounded and, and centered around the person we're, uh, we're providing care for. Um, I meant, I'm, 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 I'll be honest, I'll be straight, I'm apprehensive, but I'm also excited to share this session with you. I'm no by no means um, uh, an expert in mindfulness. I've studied it. I'm studying to teach it and mentor and, and facilitate it. Um, but there's always, I feel, something to learn with mindfulness. Um, I always find myself, especially in the work that I do, which I'll give you an introduction in a moment, is that the mindfulness has been such a, a resource of resiliency for me in the work that I do. However, I always feel, and, and you might be able to relate to this, I always feel that there's more to learn, not so much about the practice and technique of mindfulness, but fully transparently, utilizing mindfulness practice to learn about myself and to become more aware about myself. And I think that's part of the essence of what mindfulness is and what mindfulness practice uh, is. Currently, I am uh, a case manager with Kensington Health. I facilitate the caregiver groups. I facilitate uh, caregiver support one-on-one. -on -one. I also facilitate bereavement groups and bereavement one-on-one. -on -one. And we have this wonderful collaborative effort with Wellspring between my specific program, which is Second Mile Club, within Kensington Health and uh, Wellspring in supporting caregivers. I also sit at bedside in the hospice that we have, a 10-bed hospice next door, and I sit at bedside providing psychosocial support for people who are who are dying, who are living with their illnesses and, and, and dying in our hospices, and as well as with their families. And this, you could imagine, is a very interesting time to apply mindfulness practice. And I think what the pandemic or COVID-19 has done or has precipitated and catalyzed for us is an introspection of how we feel about the world around us. And without being too, um, how can I say, uh, new ages or, or, or fluffy about this, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that the impact of the pandemic on the multiple losses we may have experienced in, in uh, in, in our everyday, considering tomorrow is the one year since, um, you know, we went into what we'd call lockdown or, or precautions or restrictions from, uh, with respect to COVID-19. Um, the losses, the collateral losses, the deaths, but also the losses we've had in our lives financially, economically, socially, with physical or social distancing, and especially as it impacts caregivers. And I think mindfulness, as I'll share with you today, has had a tremendous, tremendous traction right now in supporting and building any measure of resiliency or even capacity to survive mentally, emotionally, existentially, spiritually during this time. As I feel caregivers have been taxed, I feel the most in, in not being able to, you know, um, provide support the way they have in the past or seek self-care or support themselves during a time where all these avenues with which they were able to care for themselves have been blocked. So the impact of, of, of the pandemic um, has, especially for us here at, at Kensington Health, has brought around a lot of focus on mindfulness as a self-care measure, as a dissipation of trauma, as, as imposed by us by the pandemic, as a dissipation of the experience of grief and loss, um, and and not just a dissipation, but a, even a, a basic awareness of it, a mindfulness of it, a, a presence with it. Um, and for example, we've you know for for our Kensington uh, families who have uh, loved ones here, or family members here at the the residence, we started a, a mindfulness group um, that meets every Tuesday night from six to seven thirty, just to give another measure, another avenue with which to seek self-care, find self-care, find aspects of uh, introspection, self-reflection that can help dissipate the uh, experiences of, uh, of um, the, the pandemic, you know, especially as a caregiver. So a lot of this is, how can I say, has a, 
um, a focus uh, as a result of the pandemic. And uh, of course my work, and, and I'm very privileged to do this work in supporting caregivers has come and interfaced and been exposed to the challenges of caregivers, especially with respect to the, the pandemic. Um, and, and the impact it's had on caregivers has left some aspect even of, of and I, I use this word uh, appropriately, of traumatization, meaning we're many times we're constantly in fight or flight, fight or flight, freeze or fawn. Our nervous systems are heightened. We're in hyper arousal. We're, you know, we're, our bodies are carrying so much tension. Our minds are extremely busy. Um, as a result of the, the caregiving challenge. And I feel many, I hear so many stories of caregivers or people uh, um, providing caregiving in that he, that, uh, that there's this, this pressure or even a, a feeling of impending doom or a, a sense of, of even guilt or, or um, um, this, this tension that comes with providing caregiving. Very interestingly is that a, a practice of mindfulness, a regular practice of mindfulness can oftentimes help alleviate a lot of these experiences, maybe not even just alleviate, but bring an awareness to. I know we were in our group last night, in our mindfulness group last night, it's amazing just through a five minute practice, what percolated, what precipitated, what came to the service, what arose as we brought our attention to the present moment and brought our attention to our bodies. And I'll expand on that a little bit as, as we go through the presentation. And I, I didn't put many words, folks, if we're gonna be talking about mindfulness in this session, I think I'm, we're gonna do it from an abstract thought, from just listening to what I'm sharing with you and allow your mind to absorb what, what the information is rather than having check boxes and PowerPoint and, 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 and what have you because that's kind of contradictory to, to mindfulness in many ways. Just be present with what I'm gonna to share to you. See what absorbs, see what sticks, see what permeates by osmosis into your minds and hearts and see how that's taken away from you, okay? Taken away with you. And given the charge, the charge that caregivers are carrying today of their own, I was talking to a caregiver two days ago and it's incredible how spent she is and yet, she provides 24-hour care for her, for her dad. She's not able to, caregivers are coming and going and, and there's a shortage of PSWs. Uh, there's this, you know, apprehension of bringing somebody into the home. There's literally a charge within her, right? That, that she feels, and I hear that from a lot of caregivers, they're charged. They have this almost excess nervous energy or anxious energy. Oftentimes their minds are very busy because they have so many duties and responsibilities to, to, to their caregiver, caregiver role, right? And there's a charge, there's a nervous system uh, excitement and not an excitement like a roller coaster, coaster, although it could be, or not an excitement in the sense of, of uh, a pleasurable experience, but an excitement and anxiousness and apprehension that pervades the nervous system, that mindfulness or mindfulness practices can serve to dissipate calm and bring back to a present moment because our minds are very powerful you know when we ruminate we worry we think and there's a lot to worry about a lot to feel threatened and vulnerable to i mean there's this invisible you know virus out there that we don't know where it is it's highly contagious there are variations of it now you can get it by touching something that can create a heightened sense of vulnerability and, and threat within ourselves and that threat can be feeling like a, a sense of charge. And over time, that becomes a memory or a traumatization to ourselves. And we're gonna talk about how mindfulness can actually intersect and, and um, not palliate, but ameliorate a lot of that sense of charge. And so people ask, you know, oftentimes, what is mindfulness? How is it different from meditation? What's all these different types of mindfulness and all these types of meditation? You're right. There's a, a multitude of forms and, and styles and even definitions of mindfulness. There's a multitude of forms and, and definitions and styles of, of meditation. And are they the same? Are they different? Because sometimes you have meditation and sometimes you have mindfulness and then you have mindfulness meditation. And then I get really screwed up. I'm like, what is this all? And for me, 
and I, I can only speak from, I mean, you could Google it very easily, right? And get 1,000, 1 million hits. But for me, as I studied, I studied with Serena Institute, um, what I've come to really appreciate and become aware of is mindfulness can be a technique as somewhat differentiate from meditation, which I feel in my experience and my knowledge is that it's a focus on one thing to quiet the mind. I can't quiet my mind. I can observe it and just not attach to it, not judge it and not comment on it. And I feel that's a form of mindfulness. And mindfulness could be anywhere from a minute or two to multiple hours. It's bringing your attention and awareness to the present moment of what's happening and what's arising right here, right now. It's a form of being in what has been coined the now, right? And very popularly so. It's an intention just to be present with what is, what's stirring in your mind without trying to get rid of it, quiet it, excite it, erase it, suppress it. It's just being aware of it. It's also like um, not judging or commenting or becoming attached or being drawn into what's happening in our mind and in our bodies. And folks, a lot of our experience as caregivers, especially when it becomes, when it overloads our nervous systems and becomes a form of, of traumatization, um, which is sometimes very natural, uh, affects our bodies, right? It becomes somaticized, it becomes part of our bodies. Mindfulness isn't just mind. Mindfulness is also actually what happens to our bodies. What's happening in my body? Can I feel my body, right? Can I? Can I feel my clothes on my body? Can I feel what's happening in my body? It's amazing, especially with caregivers and even myself, because I'm, I'm a caregiver both formally and informally, meaning I do it for a living for Kensington Health, but I also um, support two aging adults, my parents and one of them who has a palliative trajectory. How I hold emotion, certain parts of my body. And when I have a mindfulness practice, it actually brings awareness to where that emotion is. And that's why sometimes, uh, folks, mindfulness isn't always calming. Sometimes in mindfulness, meaning when we bring our mind and our attention to our bodies, our present moment, our hearts, our breathing, stuff starts to come up. There's an arising. There could be emotions. There can be grief. There can be guilt. These feelings start to arise. Part of mindfulness is recognizing these rising feelings, these rising emotions, these rising sensations in our bodies, these thoughts in our minds. All we do is observe it. And in observation, oftentimes there's this buffer that's created between observing and being a part of it. And it's a witnessing. I feel like we, we don't necessarily become an identity of an observer. I'm not quite in tune with that because I feel that separates us from the experience. But there is a buffer that we become witnessing or observing what's happening to us. And in the observing, our nervous systems almost deregulate, not deregulate, are regulated, are calmed, or are, are in some ways disconnected from what's happening, especially in our hearts and minds, which is oftentimes for caregivers, a lot of stressful, stressful events, right? One of the most common things I hear from caregivers, uh, whether it's a long-standing illness or short-standing illness, you know, for Wellspring, it's, it's, it's obviously cancer, is how long is this going to go on? So there's even a focus on the future when it comes to care, uh, caregiving and bringing this sense of presence and awareness of what it feels like to even think about a future as such and the feelings that arise. Right? Um, I'll, I'll also expand on this a little bit further uh, later in the session, but literally folks, mindfulness can happen in a minute, two minutes, uh, anywhere, anytime, right? All it takes is just to sit and take a moment of pause to be present to feel, to sense, to become aware. You know, when I'm at work, sometimes I'll just step outside and literally I look up and I can't tell you, I'll just look around and, and, and just take a moment and take in my environment. I can't tell you how much I notice. I've been working here for over a year. I'm like, I never saw that, that there. Oh, I never saw that. And it's that experience of awareness that can change even the way we perceive our worlds. And it could bring things into perspective. Right? It could bring such an expansiveness and a recognition of all that's around us, that's going on around us, that we don't always are aware of when 
we are under stress, especially uh, as caregivers. And you might ask, why is that? Why is that important? Because sometimes when the nervous system is heightened into fight or flight, it sees a very narrow. It's responding to a very nar narrow, focused uh, perception. And usually that perception, when, uh, when especially when the nervous system locks in and the mind locks in, can be something that's worrying, fearful, anxiety provoking, you know, perceived threat. Okay, that we don't see outside of that. And when we can see outside of that, for example, I'm sitting here presenting to you and for sharing information with you. My mind could race and say, oh, what's going to happen tonight if, I, if my car breaks down? Or what's going to happen if somebody starts to die? Am I going to walk over? Do I have time? Or my daughter, she's at school. You know, I didn't hear from her today, but there was an amber alert, you know, and your mind starts to race. But where I'm here right now, I am relatively safe, but the mind doesn't know that. But with mindfulness, when you bring yourself to the present, to your environment, we have an opportunity to respond to it in the proportionality that it kind of warrants. We start to respond to what is rather than what our minds create. And unfortunately, social media and media and all this can really heighten. I, I stopped watching a lot of news because it can really heighten our sense of threat. When we're just lying in bed with a cup of coffee or tea, well, maybe not a cup of coffee when you go to bed, but some kind of beverage, you're in a, possibly in the safety of your home or safety of some, some shelter, um, however it's perceived as safe. And nothing's really happening that's threatening, but our minds can create it as such. And that heightens our fight or flight and makes us, you know, stressed. Mindfulness brings your attention back to here and now. What is happening? What's really happening now? Now, what's happening in my mind in the past and the future? What's happening right now is the desk feels cold. How is my breathing? I, uh, one of the caregivers last night, uh, she's so lovely. She said um, uh, she had never realized she was holding her breath until she entered a mindfulness practice. And like, I'm holding my breath. And she went on to talk about what it meant to hold her breath, but she didn't even recognize that she, I do that all the time in holding our breaths or, or our breath. Mindfulness can bring your awareness to that because so much happens within our bodies that we're unaware of. So basically what it does is help you expand your perception to see what is, not what is necessarily being conjured in our minds, but what really is, right? And, and when we see what is, we react to what is, or we have time to respond to what is, rather than a reactionary, um, impulsive uh, response to what is created with our minds. And that's what mindfulness can do. It can create, that practice um, can help to create, I mean, I say create because it, it, is, it is almost a creation, uh, that sense of uh, presence and relating to what is. And meditation can be a form of mindfulness. I, I like to personally think, and, and this is just my opinion, my studies, what, I've, what, I, what I'm sharing with you. Mindfulness can be um, an ab, sorry, meditation can be an avenue for, for, for practicing mindfulness, but there's multiple forms of, of meditation. There's multiple aspects, of, even between the religions and cultures and practices and yogas, they, there's different, what meditation can mean. And I'm not so much uh, a meditator. I mean, there's definitely benefits to it. There's actually evidence-based research done on the impact of um, meditation. For me, I, I do meditate, but it's the mindfulness that is important to me. It's the mindfulness that I don't need to sit in a particular place or even a particular posture to be mindful. And I think that's important in our very busy, technologically bombarded, um, you know, pandemic ridden lives that we can have a practice that we can do anywhere, anytime with any kind of circumstances. So for example, one of the caregivers said, can I practice mindfulness while I'm waiting for my COVID test? Of course, it takes two minutes, 30 seconds, just to feel the ground under your feet, to feel, you know, your, your socks on. And, and I, I ask this to people, can you feel your undergarments? Can you feel your underwear? I mean, you could feel when you put it on in the morning if you wear underwear, but throughout the day, we lose that touch. I mean, part of that is proprioception or what have you, but if you really, really pay attention to it or mindfulness, 
you can feel it. You can actually feel aspects of it. And you can do that at any time, anywhere. And it could serve to bring a measure, how can I say this, of relationality within our nervous system to see what is, right? Rather than to respond what's being conjured in our minds. So by all means, meditation is a, it can be expressed as a form of mindfulness. There's mindfulness in meditation, but you don't have to meditate to be mindful. And I think that scares a lot of people off. Well, do I have to meditate? I don't know how to meditate. Do I sit in for three hours? Do I gotta get a special cushion? Do I have to have a special place in my room, you know, with incense and candles and no, 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 no. Mindfulness can be done anywhere, at any time, in any circumstances. I'll give you another example. Sometimes when I'm walking to work or walking away from work or, or at home or out with my daughter, I just walk a little bit more slowly so I can feel the ground under my feet and to listen to the ground under my feet. That's a form of mindfulness. You bring in your mind and your attention to the present moment, taking in what you're experiencing, feeling from inside what is being experienced. And that, and you might ask, so what does that do? That in effect, brings your nervous system, your nerves, to react to or respond to the present moment, which can be calming. Calming, mindfulness isn't necessarily about calming. Mindfulness is about reacting and responding to what is. And the nervous system calming in those regards is a byproduct, a collateral benefit uh, as a result of. But I don't, I'm not mindful to calm my mind. I'm mindful to see my environment, my situation, the people I'm talking to as they are. And I've been asked, is, is, uh, is mindfulness a form of yoga, right? You have to do yoga to be mindful. Like it definitely can be. I mean, a lot of yoga practice isn't just postures like this lovely lady is, is able to do, which I'll never do. It isn't just about postures, but there is a mindfulness in yoga. But yoga and mindfulness are not necessarily the same thing. Mindfulness is an aspect of yoga, but you don't have to do yoga to be mindful. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and I'm hoping not to create more information, but more dispel a lot of the information out there and the associations between, you know, mindfulness and everything else. You know, there's, and, and you'll see later in the presentation, there's mindful eating, there's mindful shopping, there's mindful bathing, there's mindful walking. And all you're doing is adding an awareness of the present moment to anything you're doing. And, and I've heard from others who practice mindfulness uh, uh, extensively that this can become a habitual practice that you do all day, but not necessarily. I can't do it all day, but I do it in spurts because it almost resets my nervous system. It almost resets my perception. It actually makes me more acute to my, my, my sensations, my, my, my sensory system. And it brings me more to, to respond to, to what is. That calms my nervous system. That can be a measure of resiliency, right? Especially if you wanna relate this to caregivers, uh, folks. Um, I hear from caregivers a lot as, as I'm a caregiver, is that we, we can't think about the past, how our family member or loved one was, what is happening now, what's going to happen in the future. I think with caregivers, it's hard to stay present. And so the past and the, and the, the, the reflection of that and all that's been lost with the person we're caring for can create a lot of grief. And then we look to the future, what's going to happen to them, what's going to happen to my life, what happens if they die, what happens if they live like this for another 10 years. Those, those reflections are important, but to always bring it back to the present moment where you are here and now. And even when we're reflecting on those times of the past and the future, mindfulness is to be aware of the feelings that come up as we reflect on those pasts and futures, right? It's not to <clears throat> get consumed or lost in the what is, but also to be aware and mindful of what emotions and sensations with the, within the body do those perspectives bring up. Another aspect of mindfulness, and I think this is actually um, uh, something Mr. Michael Stone wrote in his book, uh, The World Comes to You, um, is that mindfulness, a great deal of mindfulness is mourning. And if you, if you don't quite know what mourning is, mourning is the externalization or the expression 
and, and what we do to when we're grieving, right? Like going to funerals, like some people dress in black, depending on cultures and customs, what have you, like creating life reviews and, and legacies and what have you. It's how we externalize uh, a grief. And mindfulness brings us to an awareness of how each moment dies to the next moment. It brings us an awareness that we were different yesterday and the day before and who we are today. There's an aspect of loss and letting go in mindfulness because you're aware that today I am different from what I was and there are aspects of me that have changed and in change there's loss and in loss there's grief and externalization or activity through grief is mourning. And mindfulness is a form of that. Mindfulness is becoming aware of who we are now that's changed and different from who we were, or even our environments. I think a lot of what's happening right now is a great deal of grief, but not enough mourning when it comes to COVID. We're not really aware. I mean, tomorrow, you know, I won't call it an anniversary, but it's the commemoration of when COVID really hit our country in terms of lockdown and restrictions and what have you and the people that have died and, and, and all the non-death loss, related losses that we've had. Mind, mindfulness of what has happened to us and how it feels to us right now is part of the externalization or the activity of grieving. And that's why mindfulness can be a form of, of mourning. I wish we taught mindfulness in, and I wish my daughter at nine years old was taught mindfulness in her schools in association with grief and loss and, and traumatization. And of course, bringing her nervous system down to the present moment so that she can respond to what is rather than what's conjured in the mind. That's mindfulness, right? The utopia is to live mindfully every day, all day, right? And, and I'm sure there's people that have achieved that, but we can start with just five minutes, five minutes today, five minutes tomorrow, five minutes in an hour, two minutes. I, I'm sorry, I don't, Quite, and I apologize for this because I don't want it to seem uh, uh, harsh, but we do have the time, even as caregivers, we can find five minutes to practice a form of mindfulness. There's a, an organ, a, um, a plot of land, a, 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 a center that I used to work at uh, called Joshua Creek Heritage Arts Center. And at the back, they had um, uh, such a structure, right? Um, uh, um, and part of the mindfulness was to walk into the labyrinth with a question, right? And as you walk through the labyrinth, it almost forced you to slow down and monitor each step. And hopefully by the time that you finish the labyrinth, your question would have been answered in your mind. But it's not about the answering of the question. This is a form or an example of activity that can be um, engaged to help facilitate mindfulness. For people like myself, sitting is, is always a challenge. Walking and moving through a particular pathway, such as a labyrinth, which, which this is, helps bring my attention to the present moment because I have to watch each step as I move and turn and go around and not get lost, not step on the rocks and, and what have you. And there's a multitude of ways with which to practice uh, mindfulness. Another example is I visited a hospice um, in, uh, some, in in San Francisco called Zen Hospice Project and unfortunately the actual structure uh, has closed now but they still have the Laguna Center. And outside each person's room, it's a center that supported, began supporting people who were living with AIDS and dying of AIDS, but now it, it, at the time of its opening uh, supported people living and dying of, uh, of life-limiting illnesses and predominantly cancer. But out the, outside each room, there was a set of footprints so that everybody that was stepping into somebody's room to, their, to, their, to, to, to be with them had to stop and take pause before they stepped in. That pause is a momentary check-in. It's literally five to 10 seconds, a momentary check-in with themselves. It was mindfulness. It was almost a, a constructed, structured mindfulness, right? So you'd watch these nurses and physicians and volunteers and PSWs walk in and out of the rooms, but would stop, take a breath and step in. Now imagine if we lived our lives like that, just to have, make opportunities to stop, right? Whether it's structured time, I know there's a lot of apps for it right now, whether it's structured time or just for me, myself, 
it's an awareness that I just need to stop for a minute or two minutes or three minutes and bring my awareness to the here and now, which doesn't mean we don't, we, we cancel out the busy thoughts. It's that it's with the busy thoughts that we're aware that we have busy thoughts and at the same time reflecting on, on where we are and, and, and what we're doing. And again, reflecting on uh, caregivers and the plight of caregivers, one of the one of the most, and I don't think this is actually a word, right? But I'm going to create it right now for the world to see. <laughs> one of the most unmindful practices is focusing on the future and the past. Now, I would never, I mean, I, I do it as if, as if everybody else. I would never advocate for somebody to stop thinking about the future, stop thinking about the past, just be in the present, right? And I, I don't, especially at Caribous, I don't know if we can do that. It's, it's a very tall task. So what I ask instead is just be mindful of when you are in the past and the future, what does that feel like? Bring your awareness to what are you thinking about the future? Not just being in the future, but what are you thinking about it? And what are you feeling about it? And then check in with your body to see if there's a sensation in it. When we do that, especially the checking in with the body, it brings us almost a grounding. And we can't help, in most cases, to be present because we're in tune with the experience of the perspective of the future or the past, right? That brings us to the present moment. And in bringing us to the present moment, it can ground us and bring our awareness to what is happening right now, even with the thoughts going past and future, right? We practice that a lot in our caregiver groups. We have a caregiver group here at, uh, at Kensington Health, and we have a caregiver group uh, that meets at Wellspring, which is going fantastic in terms of attendance and, and participation and engagement. And we practice this aspect of mindfulness. Your mind will drift to the future, especially as we apprehensive what's going to happen to the person we're caring for and what's going to happen to me as I care for them, or it drifts to the past of what once was and no longer is. The trick or the key to it is to be aware and present with the experience of it, which brings us to the present moment, right? Because in the awareness, in mindfulness, the awareness of the present moment does not preclude to subduing the mind, suppressing the mind, centered focus on, 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 uh, on an object so that you become of no mind. That's not the aspect, that's not the, necessarily the intentionality of, of mindfulness. And often, oftentimes, um, although there's different schools of thought, oftentimes that can be suppressive. Right, and it's not necessarily uh, uh, something I can even I can do. What a lot of mindfulness is, what a mindfulness practice is, is just recognizing what is the busyness in the mind, being aware of it. Once you're aware of it, there's this obser observatory effect where you can see your mind busy. But once you be have that observatory witnessing effect, you're grounding in the present moment. But you'll feel your mind, your 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 attention, because your attention. And what's going on in your mind aren't necessarily the same thing, right? Your attention will might start drawn back into it. And then you have, especially in mindfulness practice, a way to bring it back and ground in the moment. And I'll share with you, you these, these practices in a moment of how to do that, such as just feeling the clothes on your body, smelling the air, feeling the contact of the air going into your lungs. I mean, one of the most effective strategies in mindfulness to bring awareness and attention to the here and now is breath. It's being focused on our breath, feeling our breath, observing it. And in fact, I did that backwards. It's actually observing the breath coming in and then feeling it and then just allowing it to, to, uh, to take place on its own. So in essence, and again, I hear from caregivers because in many ways we're very self-critical, you know, we're hard on ourselves. I hear from caregivers, such as the group last night, I, I suck at this. I'm failing in this because I can't turn off my mind. But that's not the point with mindfulness. Mindfulness is not turning off the mind. Mindfulness is recognizing that the mind is very much turned on. And in the recognition awareness, it brings you back to the present moment, which in and of itself can calm the mind. And with regular practice, regular, regular practice, it doesn't necessarily calm the mind. It just becomes, you just developed almost an ability or skill not to be drawn into the mind and the activity of the mind to be able to witness it and observe it 
and not react or respond to it. Because you know where we get in trouble where is when we react to what is the busyness in our minds as if it's a present. The body and the mind don't know necessarily um, the reality from, from, from creation and conjuring in our minds. And this is a practice we do in, in mindfulness groups is that we take our minds to a calm place and then you take your mind to an anxiety provoking place, your body will follow. And that's how we live our everyday lives, right? That's a lot of respect for that. That's probably a lot of road rage as well. Although it's, it's and, and they thought road rage would calm down because there's less traffic when it actually hasn't because the tension is, is within us and it just has avenues with which to express itself, especially if we're not mindful, uh, mindful of it. So the, really the aspect or the, the fundamental principle of mindfulness is to be here now, which includes a busy mind, which includes aches and pains and sensations. It's just to be in the present moment, being in the here and now and recognizing what is, what's happening to my body, what's the sensations in my body, what's the sensation in my mind, right? What am I thinking about? What am I worrying about? But not being involved in the worry, just in recognition, being here and now. And there's, again, there's so many schools of thought and religious practices and cultures and spiritualities that will tell you about the benefits of being present they're innumerable right my experiences about being being present is that i have an opportunity and i know I'm, I'm saying this over and over again like a mantra which is can be a form of meditation and mindfulness is being present can have our nervous systems react to what is which is most of the time not necessarily threatening or dangerous or worrisome or fearful and that can quiet our nervous system just as a collateral benefit which can, especially for caregivers, prevent exhaustion, chronic fatigue, and, and burnout. And I, I love this depiction because I find our attention, you know, our, our awareness, our mindfulness is like that feather. And it's sitting on water, which is all the emotion and body sensations and thoughts that's going around in us. And any time that attention can sink in there and become wet and disappear, right? We lose, we lose attention, we lose focus, right? And, and a visualization that I carry is that, that this exact depiction is to have my attention awareness just like a feather floating on the surface of all that is. Not diving into it, not getting wet by it, not getting soaked by it, not by sinking into it, but just float on it. And in the floating, you have just enough contact to see it, to feel it, to experience it without being immersed in it. And as those waves get bigger and it get wet and it starts to rain, you just ride with it. And in that sense of presence, there's a, there's a response rather than a reaction, right? And there's a difference between response and reaction. Reaction, has, reaction is, is oftentimes impulsive um, and, and involves a lot of the fight or flight and, and doesn't necessarily have mindfulness to it responding has a sense of mindfulness because we are seeing the environment as it is, as it's presenting to us. We're aware of our perception of it. We're aware of our feeling and body sensations to it. And we respond to it in a, in a measure that may be more proportional and not out of tune with what, uh, what's actually happening. And a, a large aspect of mindfulness, as I've mentioned, is this grounding or awareness in breath. It's bringing our attention through the practices to breath, to breathing, to the aspects of, uh, of breathing. And folks, I'm, I'm, this session isn't so much about teaching you techniques or actually practicing with you, because I'd love for you to come to one of our groups to experience it, right? This is just to bring the benefits of what mindfulness is. And very, very simply, how, how amazing is it that we have something that is automatic innate you don't have to learn it such as breathing that is the simplest access to presence alertness awareness and mindfulness it's really just even bringing our our attention to how we breathe and that can happen anywhere anytime uh in any place right um and that in and of itself can have an impact on our, our nervous system because when we recognize our breath we can actually sometimes change it or, or modify it 
or amplify it or, or decrease it, which has a direct effect on our heart rate and our, and our nervous systems. And we focus on the breath or when we focus, when we bring awareness to what is happening with us. Another important principle or quality uh, uh, of, of mindfulness, I, I like to think of, of, of mindfulness to be more qualitative in terms of what's happening to us and meditation to be more quantitative, right? And, and I won't get too much into that, but, but the qualitative part is just um, a touch and a feel of what's happening with us. And in through mindfulness, we recognize what's arising within us. We become aware of emotions, thoughts, anxieties, fears, phobias, um, perspectives. There's an awareness of what's arising when we stop, breathe, pause, and feel. Right? It creates space. It creates um, almost like a vacuum with which that which is stirring within us or suppressed or hidden or repressed or living in our fat tissue, in our bodies, in our in somaticized starts to surface. That's why mindfulness is, is a par very powerful tool in supporting caregivers, in supporting traumatization, in supporting and companioning grief and, and loss and mourning because it, it brings an awareness of what is arising. And, and I think that's one of the biggest challenges we have, especially when we have uh, uncontrolled reactionary responses, because we don't recognize what's arising until it has arisen. Right? I love mindfulness for this. And if you do it in small segments throughout the day, or you know, throughout, I would say throughout the day, just two minutes here, five minutes here, three minutes here, then we can constantly almost, uh, gain an ability to recognize what's arising within us before it becomes to a point where the nervous system overflows in burnout, in yelling, in screaming, in exhaustion, in, 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 you know, in, in, in absolute stress and anxiety. That's, that's an aspect of mindfulness that's very powerful, this arising, right? And it could be arising or it could be arising. It doesn't necessarily have to be a, 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 a linear vertical uh, uh, direction. And in that, in that arising, what we come to also recognize is the, how that arising touches every aspect of us. You know, it's simply like this depiction of a, of a, of a droplet in, in water. It's that arising, but it's not just that. It's also all that it touches us, how that arising makes us body feels, our, our, our heart rate, our breathing, our mind. So if you're focused on multiple aspects of yourself, you can't help but be present. Because there's all this to 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 that will will take your attention and awareness to the present moment, and that's the learning I find when I talk to open up the session today about mindfulness. That's the learning that I find happens within me in learning about myself. Is this regular check in, pausing and check in to what is arising within me and how it touches all other parts of me, including my environment. And mindfulness isn't just about feeling good okay that's a big misconception it's about just feeling what is without judgment without commentary um for some you know being in a meditative state brings them a sense of euphoria utopia ecstasy excess whatever like but mindfulness is a little bit different it's just feeling what is and the lack of judgment or the non-judgment comes from not thinking it's good or bad whatever is arising Right? It is just arising and becoming aware of it. And many times, not just sometimes, many times, those would not necessarily be defined as good vibes. Right? They're defined for whatever they are. And it's that non-judgment that we, we, we try to employ with, uh, with, with mindfulness. Now, the judgment is, is, is interesting, an interesting piece, because for, especially for caregivers, a lot of those feelings, such as last night, what we experienced, is feelings that are, I like to call sticky like guilt, like resentment, like anger, you know, like hopelessness. And when we recognize those arising, we become aware, maybe what's causing them, their relationality with what's happening, their proportionality to what's happening. Like, are they really uh, appropriate to what's happening? And does it matter if it's appropriate, but it's a feeling and that's arising through mindfulness. And sometimes what comes up in mindfulness folks can be the subtlety of emotions, can be the subtle, sensitive, just fringe feelings, or it can be heavy emotion. 
some aspects of mindfulness, such as um, body sensations, a lot of times where emotion is stored, can lead to a lot of emotion uh, surfacing. And, and we can manage and self-regulate that emotion by being very present with it. Because if we're not present with it and we don't learn how to be mindful of it, that's the emotion that usually overflows and either creates physical pathology in us or is outburst into, into our environments and sometimes causes us strife and conflict and disturbances and what have you. I'll give you another example. Um, I recognize I have Crohn's and I get attacks once every six months or a year or two years or what have you. And the pain is excruciating. And I recognize the Crohn's attacks come along when I'm not mindful of my daily emotions as it's stored in my in my belly. Now, I never used to know that until I started practicing mindfulness and recognizing where do I store emotion? It's in my belly, right? Which I'm not surprised because I have Crohn's because they kind of go hand in hand. And if I'm mindful of that and have a regular for mindful practice of that emotion in my belly, it never gets to a point where I have an attack and I'm screaming in pain because even when I have that attack, if I'm mindful of the attack and the pain and the sensation of pain in the attack, if I'm very aware of it, the emotion of it speaks so much to me, which is my developmental childhood traumatization. But it doesn't need to get to that because I have a practice of daily mindfulness of where the emotion is being stored in my body. And it's kind of a cool practice because I can feel it move and where it builds up and bring my attention there, even momentarily throughout the day, especially if I'm spending time with people or talking to people where the emotion is heavy. I feel it. And in creating that feeling, it, it loosens and it doesn't get stored and then it can dissipate just through mindfulness and awareness of it. And this is reflective also. Some, pe some, some of us or some people call it layers, right? And I find, and I can only again speak for myself, is that mindfulness has helped me go through, I wouldn't say they're necessarily layers because you don't peel one back and then there's another one, peel one. They're all kind of convoluted, but there's depths and there's densities. I like to call them densities. Mindfulness has helped me traverse the densities within my heart and mind and my body. It's brought me to an awareness of the density of emotions that can build up. Unfortunately, I find if we, especially as caregivers, if we're not mindful of the density of emotion that can build up over time, then it almost either becomes so heavy and so crystallized and so in many ways, pathology producing that it, it takes effort to be present with it because sometimes it can be painful and sometimes it can be um, uh, anxiety or it can be traumatizing what have you but it doesn't negate the fact of an opportunity to be present with it to be mindful of it um, because really the way to 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 uh, a way to engage it is in that presence and mindfulness without the judgment and, and commentary. And for me, it's worked very well. I didn't start until I was in my 40s to recognize these densities. And literally, I call them densities, not layers, because they feel they have different energy or potency to them. And I just bring my awareness and attention to them. It's not therapy. I'm not trying to under necessarily understand, investigate, and get in there. I just just feel them you know, within uh, within my heart and body. And it helps to gain a different perspective when we're mindful of those densities within our body because they oftentimes through their, for lack of better wording, their fragrance, their perfume, their, 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 their scent as it percolates. Like it, there's no, I don't believe there's any such thing as putting something in a box and shelving it and compartmentalize it. It leaks, okay? Some way it leaks and it leaks and it creates a perception for us. And in that perception, we see the world sometimes very differently from what it actually is, right? Which can cause us a great deal of suffering and strife, especially as caregivers, especially with all our challenges as, as caregivers. Mindfulness of that density, mindfulness of our perception, mindfulness of that which creates our perception of the world can garner a more accurate perception of that world and affect how we feel about it. And that can alleviate in, in uh, our stress uh, uh, and, and, and what have you. And another form of a, a practice that I find is a gifted to us is awareness and mindfulness of sensations within our body. For example, one of the one one of the practices that we use is called points of contact, right? Like, can you feel where your clothes start 
and your 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 where your sleeves start and when your scared skin's exposed can you feel the different temperatures can you feel clothing on you can you feel yourself in the chair can you feel the air around you can you feel the air as you walk through these sensations awareness of these sensations are just simply measures and somewhat techniques to bring your focus to the present moment to bring your awareness mindfully so into the body because as i mentioned the body is a storehouse for a lot of what's happening in our environments. I find even a sense of mindfulness. I check in with my body when I'm talking to somebody or in front of somebody or in the space of somebody, or even if I go into a room that somebody's been in there. Because being mindful in it, you just feel the vibe, the energy, the, the whatever, the atmosphere, and you pick it up in your bodies. And I'm very sensitive to that. It makes me good in my work, but it also can overload my nervous system. That awareness, that mindfulness, that presence within our bodies allows us an opportunity to, to respond. For example, it's either sometimes, you know, what's called the nonviolent crisis intervention angle, angle, angle when you're standing with somebody and you're having a conversation or an argument or very emotional uh, interaction, is how if you're very mindful of your body, you create space and allow that space between you and someone else but you don't really create that or feel it unless you're present within your body. So mindfulness in our day-to-day -day activities can actually help us to interact with others and protect ourselves and know what situations to be in and to be more acutely aware of, of risks and situations and environments and people's emotions. I think animals are extremely mindful. Like maybe that's why most animals didn't, weren't affected by the tsunami uh, when it first came in, I don't know, five or 10 years ago. I think they're acutely aware of their, of their present moment, right? And I think as humans, we've, we've lost a lot of that awareness. We've become very past, future, mind, busy, disconnected from, from the present moment. We've lost innate ability of mindfulness. And mindfulness is innate. It's only, it's not so much that, you know, you have to, gain a skill set for it. You just have to learn that you have it and access it. You already have it within yourselves. It's a relearning of it or very simply a reaccessing of it because it's part of who and what we are naturally. And one, one amazing exercise, this is an example and I wish I could do it with you folks, but one example of the power of mindfulness and the mind, okay, is this imaginary um play that we have in our minds it's a it's a journey of the mind that can take us to a place where we can feel peaceful loved whatever emotions we want to feel and then you watch as you take your attention to that place such as this beach how your body responds and how present you can be when you intentionally bring it to a space to a time to a, to a to a location so one gentleman i was supporting who had cancer um, he had traveled the world. He had been to more countries than anybody I've ever heard of. And our practice was that we would go to those places in his mind. We'd be mindful of where he was and to recreate it to the minutest detail, meaning bringing his attention to his environment in its, in its entirety. And he said that was the only time that he wouldn't feel pain because his mind, he was so present in his mind. He was so mindful of where he was in his in his in his imaginary journeys, that it actually lowered his fight or flight and his experience of pain. That's the power of the mind, especially as it's directioned um, in 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 the intentionality of of presence. Another one that I've just mentioned is this aspect of feeling, you know, our through the body, leading sensations intentionally checking in and feeling contact points within our body, feeling the desk and feeling the chair and feeling the air around us and feeling air come in and, and go out. That's a practice that anybody can do to bring them back into the present moment, to make them aware of their bodies. And of course, there can be other sorts of imagery, right, that we can hold in our minds. For sure, if, if, if it works for you to focus on an object, I just, and, and such as a, a lotus, and bring your awareness to it so that it helps you come to the present moment, by all means, right? But I, I try to advocate for the lack of uh, necessary stimuli, such as a picture, 
such as a special room, such as incense or, or sage or cushions, because then what it creates sometimes is a habitual dependency on that, which will create the environment to bring you into a sense of mindfulness or, or meditation or presence. We would like this to become part of our every dies, everyday lives, accessible at any time, anywhere. When you put conditions on it, what ends up happening that those conditions become might become barriers to being mindful, meaning in, like the body is very habitual and very smart that way. It will need those conditions to, to access mindfulness. And as a summary, folks, here's some examples of mindfulness practice. Um, this and a, a practice of finding the breath. Um, there's a practice of points of contact on the body. There's the practice of imagining the power of the mind. There's a practice of, of body scanning, going through all parts of your body, through the tension and feeling all through your body, down to your feet, from your head to your feet, to your toes, and, and scanning it for tension, for sensations, for pain. There's uh, an aspect of mindfulness that's called giving and receiving, compassion, where you imagine yourself loving and compa being compassionate to others as you receive it from others. I think that's a lot of times where caregivers are challenged. We as caregivers are challenged. We're very good at giving compassion, but giving it to ourselves is sometimes uh, a challenge. We practice aspects of gratitude, recognizing through a mindfulness approach what we could be grateful for, not what's missing, but what is is in front of us or even very simply pausing taking a moment and just pause in your day in your every day um, we're mindful of speech even have you ever felt how words are made in your vocal cords before they come out and feel them forming in your mouth are you when you're when you're cleaning or, or you're bathing or even walking do you feel and hear the sounds of your feet on the ground or the temperature of the water or what's it like the difference between being unbathed and bathed, you know, there's a definite sensation to it in terms of how our skin feels. There's aspects of mindfulness that can, through different avenues, to calm the body, to uncharge it, to dissipate the charge from it, or what we call cooling the fire. Like for me, that fire is in, in my belly, which can also be a form of anger and, and as it arises to be recognizing and mindful of it. There's an aspect of mindfulness of just simply recognizing how much you do or don't like yourself and who and what you are and what attributes. There's, there's a form of mindfulness of just creating space for feeling. I mean, that's a lot of what mindfulness is. Creating space, allowing it to fill, and watching it rise. That's mindfulness. Or even recognizing, especially as caregivers, your needs, which can lead to many of these other aspects of you know, of uh, being able to receive compassion or being self-compassionate, but also recognizing and being aware of what your needs are. A lot of this mindfulness practice is actually in speech when we, when we do our groups. It's not just sitting and being quiet. It's actually being able to vocalize and being aware and in touch with what your needs might be. And for caregivers, oftentimes that's suppressed, repressed, pushed away, guilt-ridden, and not spoken. And I, I, I like to talk about this. And one of the, my favorite and mindfulness practices feeling the feelings, right? One of the purest forms of healing or resiliency or, or capacity building within ourselves is just to feel our feelings and being aware of what they feel like. It's one thing to have a feeling. It's quite another to be aware of what it feels like to have that feeling because we can have a feeling to a feeling, you know? We can feel guilty about being angry. We can feel resentful about being guilty. We can feel dismissed or diminished at feeling um, uh, overburdened. So that mindfulness is, is imperative, especially in feeling, not just the feeling, but what it feels like to have that feeling. And there's so many more folks, there's so many more in terms of mindfulness practices. It's, it's innumerable, but the principle is still the same. Bring in our awareness, our sense of presence to what is here and now. And as I mentioned, that can happen at any time in our daily lives, at any time. You don't necessarily have to structure it. I like to be so mindful of my body and my emotions and my mind to do it whenever I feel like it. I don't have practices morning and night and midday. No, no, my body, my mind, my heart tells me, you know, I need to pause. I want to pause. Being mindful of your needs and your responses within your body is a form of mindfulness and what they might need at that particular moment. So it's not so much a practice 
oftentimes I hear about meditation being specific time and place and a practice. Mindfulness isn't necessarily like that. It can be part of that, but mindfulness is at any time, any place, being really in tune to your environment and to yourself. And one final point, I hope this is the final point, um, is that it is a practice. It is something that can get, um, for lack of a better word, better at, um, can, uh, more, more able to do, more accessible is actually the word that I was looking for. You can access mindfulness with practice. It is a form of training your body and mind and heart to access it. Or actually, basically, it's not a training. It's a retraining to learn how to reaccess that which was already innate with us, that we've unlearned, blocked, changed, phobia, and, and what have you. And we can do that our entire lives. And it's no, there's no, there's no age where it doesn't work yet. And there's no, no, it's never too late to, to learn how to become mindful, to just to be mindful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone. Um, I love speaking about mindfulness. I love, I really appreciate and love these uh, Wellspring uh, caregiver talks. Here's my contact information. Um, if you'd like uh, any information, I'm gonna uh, stay on for a little while, but I'll stop the recording so we can have, and I can answer any of your questions, have a discussion. I'll be on for another 10, 15 minutes, but I thank you for attending today. And I hope you could take some time and some intentionality to be mindful.